A reading from Judges, chapter 6, verses 36 to 40. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is what happened. God, Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. My name is Ryan. I am your youth director. I also have the privilege of being on the teaching team here at the meeting place. And I wonder if I can show you one of my favorite paintings. Put it up on the screen here. This is called The Treachery of Images. It's a painting by Rene Marguerite. Can anyone tell me what this is a picture of? This is a painting, it's a pipe. This is a pipe, you might say, but if you speak French, you're laughing right now because you recognize that right below the pipe is this sentence that says, and pardon my French, I don't speak it. This is not a pipe. This is not a pipe. Come now. Ceci n'est pas, and I'm supposed to put a zoom. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. Was it good enough? Yeah, come now. Uh, this is not a pipe. This is not a pipe. Isn't that brilliant? Come now. Uh, let me tell you a story. The year is 1929, and like I said, there's this Belgian painter, René Magritte. He's become frustrated with the rise of the realism movement that's present in his artist contemporaries. Realism, you should know, is a movement within the art community that's all about moving away from artificiality. Okay? Artists attempt to portray their subjects with as much detail as possible, to the point in which you can hardly tell the difference between their art and real life. The, the primary goal of this art was for viewers to forget that they were even looking at an art piece. Sound cool? Bull crap, said Rene Magritte. <laughs> Probably in French. Uh, he had had enough of this oppressive rationalism. The entire point of art, did you know, is that it's a representation of something, but it will never, nor should it ever, be the thing itself. Art is more than the thing it represents. In other words, this is not a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe. And that's a really important dis distinction. In a later interview, Rene, he comments on in this painting, the famous pipe. And you almost have to read this in a French accent, but I won't. <laughs> How people reproached me for it. And yet, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. He's a clever man. He's a great painter, but I think just the chaos of this, this person. Uh, so why am I telling you about an old Belgian painter and his pipe controversy? Uh, this morning, I have been asked to teach on how to read the biblical books of history. And it's my conviction that the message of René Magritte's pipe painting is one that serves as a foundational corrective for us modern readers today as we engage with the art that is biblical history. In the same way that we need to recognize a painting of a pipe is not the pipe itself, so also do we need to recognize that biblical history, listen to this, is not historical events. Ooh, uh-oh. If you've got a problem with that, text the Q&R phone. Uh, rather, but let me explain myself first. Uh, they are texts that represent the events of history. Oh, there we go, Ryan can keep his job. Uh, let me offer this quote. Dr. John Seilhammer, he, he puts it like this. A photograph of a tree is a good example of the distinction between a text and the event depicted in it. A photograph is a representation of a tree, yet it does not have bark and leaves, nor is the sky behind the tree a real sky. To say that a photograph only represents the tree but is not actually the tree does not mean, careful here, does not mean the tree never existed or that the photograph is inaccurate because it only shows one side of the tree. Uh, the same can be said about the biblical narrative texts. To say they represent events but are not the events themselves is simply to recognize a very obvious fact about biblical narrative. They are texts, which means we stand not before events but representations 
of events through words. So you might look at this photograph of a tree, and you would say, that's a nice tree. That could be a screensaver. That could be a Windows 7 something. Uh, but then you would carry on, and you would dismiss this image, and you would go on with your day, and you say, like, I saw a picture of a tree together. You probably wouldn't remember it. However, if you're a photographer, you'll pause for a moment, and you'll recognize that this is more than a tree. This is a photograph of a tree, which means that someone took time and intention to portray this tree. They found the best angle, waited for the right time of day, found the best lighting, fine-tuned their camera settings, and click, took the photo so that this tree might be portrayed, represented in a way that mattered. Painters use their brushes to illustrate subjects. Phot photographers use their cameras to capture a moment. And likewise, biblical authors use words on paper to represent the beauty that is the history of the Bible. This is not a pipe, it's more. Biblical authors aren't simply transcribers of events, they're artists. They don't do history the way that we do history. If we want to appreciate biblical history, we need to adjust our modern expectations so that we can be brought into the ancient Eastern narrative of the biblical text. Unless we take time to understand the artistic tools with which the biblical authors are telling history, we're doomed to miss out on the genius of the biblical narrative. So, Orion, what are the biblical tools? Or what are the tools that the biblical storytellers are using? How do these ancient Eastern artists stand apart from our modern Western expectations? Well, these authors, like I said, are using words, so that is literature, to communicate a historical narrative. So when we read Bible history, we're engaging in literary narrative. So at a foundational level, every narrative has three components. You've always got a character, and they're usually in a setting, and they're going through a series of events called a plot. Character, setting, and plot. And so in previous, in previous Sundays in this series, we put a list of books on the screen that would tell you if you're reading these books, then you're reading the books of the law, or you're reading the books of history, I might say. Instead, what I'm gonna say to you is you'll have to do the work yourself. Anytime you see character, setting, and plot working in, in conjunction in the biblical narrative, you are reading biblical history, okay? Character, setting, and plot. These are the artistic tools with which the biblical authors represent history. Once we begin to understand these three tools and how they're being used, once we begin to appreciate the unique ways through which the biblical authors tell history, my hope is that this story will come alive to us in new and fresh ways. That we'll go home this Sunday, despite it being a long weekend, to fall in love with, and we'll be excited to fall in love with the narrative of scripture and the God that it reveals. So let's talk about character. Every story, every history, has characters. In most stories, we quickly identify with characters because just like them, we're in our own story. We've got our own conflicts that we need to overcome. Now, despite this, you might find it difficult to identify with the characters in the Bible. That's because the way in which Bible, biblical authors use characters as a storytelling tool is different than what us modern readers might expect. So, for example, in today's literature, we're accustomed to extended introductions and vivid descriptions of characters in their narratives. Uh, here's how the character Lisbeth is introduced in the novel The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Try to count the adjectives here. There will be a test. Lisbeth Salander was a slight woman in her 20s. Standing at just under five feet tall, her appearance was striking and unconventional. Her jet black hair was often styled in a severe cut with multiple piercings adorning her ears, nose, and eyebrows. She had a slender, almost childlike frame, but her eyes were fierce and intelligent, giving off an air of intensity and defiance. Lisbeth's body was a canvas of tattoos, the most prominent being a large dragon on her back. She dressed in black, favoring leather jackets and boots, embodying her rebellious spirit and fierce independence. Wow, what a description. It's almost like Lisbeth is here, but she's not real. It's almost like we've forgotten, pay attention, that we're reading a story. Rene Magritte is rolling in his grave. Now, I just want to demonstrate the contrast here. So here's 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're introduced to the character, King Saul. Uh, Kish, his dad, had a son named Saul. Uh, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. So we get one sentence here, two descriptors. Saul was handsome. Amen. 
and he was tall. Come on, six five, blue eyes for any Gen Z years in the house. <laughs> yeah, I think it. There's a couple of you, or us older generation who are still on TikTok. Um, so he's handsome and he's tall. That's all we're given. So how are we supposed to wrap our imagination around this? Like, what, what was he wearing? What color was his hair? Like, how big were his muscles? Come now. What color were his eyes? If you're frustrated by the lack of detail, you're not alone because the ancient Eastern biblical authors aren't meeting our modern Western expectations. They're not doing history like we do history. So how do we better understand the artist's work? Here's a helpful quote in his book, The Art of Biblical Narrative. Robert Alter writes, the Greek storytelling tendency of loading the story with details is one that modern literary practice has by and large adopted and developed. Precisely for that reason, we have to adjust our habits as readers in order to bring an adequate attentiveness to the rather different narrative maneuvers characteristic of the Hebrew Bible. The underlying biblical conception of people's character is that they're unpredictable constantly emerging from and slipping back into ambiguity. Thus, biblical narrative style is marked, pay attention, by the art of reticence. Reticence, in other words, reservation, restraint. So when it comes to understanding character in the biblical narrative, less is more. When less detail is given, more meaning is given to those details, every single detail that we read in the Bible is there intentionally to serve a purpose and draw us deeper into the narrative. So we know that Saul was tall. And that detail seems simple and unimportant until we're introduced to David, the small, young shepherd boy. And then all of a sudden, a contrast is created between these two characters that actually plays out in their story. Saul's height predicts his love of status and power. In contrast, David humbly accepts his low status as a shepherd, and he allows God to be the one to exalt him. The biblical authors are using physical attributes as symbolic narrative indicators. Saul is tall, but he falls as king. David is a young runt, and yet he is exalted as a righteous king. In this story, God exalts the humbled shepherd and grants him victory over the tall, proud tyrant. Something else you'll notice in biblical characters is the importance of names. Saul means the one who is asked for, which seems ambiguous until you read 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is the chapter right before we're introduced to Saul. The prophet Samuel is having some arguments with the people of Israel. Uh, the people of Israel refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. Why would you want to be like those guys? with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. So Israel is in rebellion against God. They're asking him for a king so that they can be like all the other nations with kings. They lack faith in God to lead them, but still God honors their asking. And in the next chapter, we're introduced to a man named Saul. What's that mean? The one who is asked for. So the biblical authors are using characters' names as a way to symbolize their role in the narrative. King Saul is the one who is asked for. King David's name means beloved. In other words, Israel might have been asking for Saul. They might have been asking for Saul, but David is God's beloved. Now, what us modern readers are going to want to do is take a story like this, and we're going to want to moralize it. We'll, we'll label heroes and villains. David is clearly the good moral hero. He's a man after God's own heart. Saul is the evil, selfish villain. So don't be like Saul, be like David, the beloved one. And you can make David a hero and feel good about it until you keep reading and you find out that the beloved one cheats on his wife and then murders the husband of the woman that he cheated with. You're like, what's going on? This isn't Sunday school. <laughs> I'll have to ask Brian if they tell that story any differently down there. What does it mean to lie beside? Um, but heroes don't do this, right? Like, David, come on now. You're misbehaving, David. You are the beloved one. What are you doing just in rebellion against God? So I'll say this as your youth director. Uh, the Bible is not a children's book. Its characters are complex. They're a mixed bag of good and evil. Pay attention. Biblical history is a realistic portrait of characters. They're compromised people, just like you and me. Characters in the Bible aren't meant to represent moral absolutes in the way that we want them to. Biblical authors intentionally withhold moral instruction 
so that the readers are forced to meditate on the text and find ourselves in the narrative. We begin to long for a truly good and faithful character. Where is the one who will honor God's, honor their role as God's beloved? Where is the king that no one asked for, but everyone needs? So when understanding characters in biblical history, pay attention to physical attributes and names. It seems simple, but it's not simplistic. See that? Resist the modern urge to moralize complex humans as either good or bad. Allow yourself to be drawn into the narrative as it points out and highlights our human condition and highlights our need for redemption. Okay, let's talk about setting. Setting. In every story, the action has to take place somewhere, and that somewhere is the setting. In most narratives, the setting is the first thing that we're introduced to. Authors can use setting as a tool to prepare the audience for what's going to happen in the story. Uh, for example, if I show you a picture of this house, something scary is going to happen here. This is like a ghost story. Ooh, don't move into there. <laughs> if I saw this on Netflix, like I'm not watching it late at night. Um, in this photo, if, if we show you a courtroom, this is a crime story, right? There's a criminal. They're fighting for something here. Uh, in the next photo, if I showed you a picture of a saloon, you're like, oh, there's probably going to be a shootout in this movie at some point. This is a Western. So these modern settings rely on our cultural norms to create an understanding between authors and their audience. Uh, settings provide an expectation of where the narrative is going. In the same way, biblical authors are using settings as a tool to tell history. Unfortunately, you won't find haunted houses and modern courtrooms and saloons in the Bible. And so as modern readers, we aren't familiar with ancient settings of biblical history. So if we want to gain access to the depth of the, Bibli the Bible's historical narrative, it is our task to become acquainted with the settings which the authors are using to reveal deeper meaning. We've got to learn the settings of the Bible. So let's look at Egypt as an example. We all know where Egypt is. Pyramids, pharaohs. Sphinxes? Is the Sphinx still around? Okay, good. It's been around for a while, so. The first time that we're introduced to Egypt in the Bible, in the biblical narrative, is in the story of Abraham and Sarah. It's not actually when everyone's enslaved in Egypt. It's, it's Abraham and Sarah, okay? What's going on? God has promised to lead Abraham to a promised land and to make him into a great nation. All Abraham has to do is obey God and trust that God will deliver him from all of the challenges that he might face. So how does Abraham do? In Genesis 12, verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land. A challenge! So will Abraham trust God, or will he go to another source? Abraham went down to Egypt. It's a bad move, Abe. And it gets worse. Check this out. In verse 11, as he was about to enter Egypt, Abram said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Come on, I married you. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that you will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. More bad decisions. Come now, Abraham disobeyed God, and now he's given his wife away? This man's gotten himself into trouble, but God is good, and so he steps in to rescue his unfaithful people. In verse 17, the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh. Sound familiar? Diseases, plagues, synonymous. And his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me this was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Oh, the day is saved. Abram and Sarai got out of Egypt. God has rescued them. Through divine intervention, God rescues his people from trouble in Egypt. So let's talk about setting. In Egypt, Egypt is a place where people go because of bad decisions. It's a place where God's people wind up in trouble. It's also a place that God rescues his people out of, typically with some sort of supernatural occurrence like plagues. Sound familiar? So check it out. This is the exact same setting that Abraham's great-grandkids find themselves in. So in Genesis 43, we're told the famine was still severe in the land. We're still hungry. So when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, uh-oh, their father said to them, go back and buy us a little more food. 
It's another famine. It's another trip to Egypt. We've seen this movie before. We don't have time this morning to go and and read what happens in this second story, but many of us know the Exodus story. The sons of Jacob, they settle in Egypt, and in future generations, they become enslaved by Pharaoh. Another bad decision. We're in trouble again. What's going to happen? Who will rescue us? Probably God. And, oh, look, he brought plagues. It's history repeated, right? It's history repeated for a purpose. This is a narrative technique. We know that Egypt is bad news, and we should get worried anytime God's people decide to go there. As an audience, our expectations for the story change based on the setting that we're in. Now, the true genius of setting is when artists mess with our expectations. We're talking about a plot twist here. So we know that Egypt is a problem. It's, it's a bad decision to seek refuge there. What a twist then when we read in Matthew chapter 2, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child, that's Jesus, and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. God is telling Mary and Joseph to leave Jerusalem, the promised land, and flee with Jesus to Egypt, that trouble place. What is happening? Well, the biblical authors are calling on our established expectations to demonstrate a profound narrative shift. Pay attention. Jerusalem has become Egypt. King Herod is behaving exactly like Pharaoh, and God is calling on that history to demonstrate this radical shift in the story. Now, Egypt is only one of the countless examples of biblical authors using setting as a tool to reveal the depths of the historical narrative in Scripture. When you read through these texts, take time to notice patterns. Have we been here before? What should I expect? And are my expectations being met? Or is there a twist in this story? So that's character. We talked about setting. Let's talk about plot in Bible history. So you've probably heard it said that context matters when reading your Bible. Just show of hands, people care about context. Does anyone not care about, well, don't raise your hand. Just listen, just please, you could use this. Um, So context matters when you're reading your Bible, and this is probably more true than any time when when you're understanding plot in biblical history, when you're following a biblical plot. So if Bible history is being told through literature, then we need to understand where we are in the literary context. And so the Catholic author, Sean McEvenue, and yes, Catholics can say good things. A lot of them do. Like Sean McEvenue, he says this. The very first, the very first and only really rigid rule in literary theory is that texts must be read from beginning to end. Finish that book you're reading, by the way. The meaning of a word is not determined by its definition, but by its context. So also, a single story's meaning is only determined by the relationship of all of its elements to the whole text. Every scene we read in biblical history falls within a larger text that informs its meaning. And as readers, we might make the mistake of making the same story have a totally different meaning if we ignore where it occurs in the plot. So before I came up this morning, uh, Steve read for us the popular story of Gideon, who was a leader of Israel. Gideon is trying to discern whether God will help Israel win a battle. And so he asks God for a sign. He takes a wool fleece, and he puts it on the ground, and he asks in the morning, that the fleece be wet with dew, but the ground around it be be dry. And then he flips it on God and he says, well, can you do it again, but reverse. And that's exactly what happens, right? God responds with a sign and Gideon gets confirmation that God will help him, hallelujah. This seems like a complete plot. There's a conflict, Gideon needs to know if he can trust God. Uh, There's a climax, he tests God, and then there's a resolution. God responds to the test and Gideon knows that he can trust God. So the, the meaning of this story is that we should, we should test God if we lack faith. So if you lack faith, put a fleece on your lawn. And you should all leave this Sunday and go and buy fleeces for your lawns. And they'll know. It's, this is, come on, it's evangelism. They'll be like, oh, there's a fleece on that lawn. That's a Christian. <laughs> um, or maybe, maybe they've actually read the context and they're like, well, that's a, they're not reading their Bible, right? Um, Because that's exactly the advice I would give if we weren't reading the context. So let's zoom out and we'll take another look at Gideon's story. Near the beginning of Judges 6, this is before the fleece scene, Gideon is called first by God to lead Israel into battle. And then even then, Gideon asks God, 
if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Really, Gideon, another test? Later, God asks Gideon to destroy an altar of another god. Gideon says yes, but halfway through verse 27, because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. What a coward. Come now, do it in the day, follow God in the light. So by the time we get to our fleece story, we've got a whole new perspective on Gideon. This isn't a thoughtful, discerning leader. This is like a faithful, faithless wimp. So why did God choose this guy? Why choose this faithless wimp? Because this isn't a story about us testing God. This is a story about God's patience partnering with broken people like you and me. See how the meaning changes? If we zoom out again, we'll see that actually the bulk of biblical history involves this repeated narrative of God calling leaders who prove to be unworthy, who require God's mercy to save them. Each story has its own conflict climax and resolution. We'll encounter countless false peaks as we're let down by failed leaders and fallen kings. Where is the faithful one? Not like Gideon. Who will lead God's people? Where is the true king who will trust God and say, not my will, but yours be done? Father. When we're reading biblical history, recognize that we're reading a collection of stories. Did you know, by the way, that the Bible just means the books? It's a collection of stories that form a grander narrative. Pay attention to literary context. How is this story impacted by the stories around it? How does its meaning change? What role is this playing in the larger text? And most importantly, where is this all headed? So character, setting, and plot. Understanding these literary techniques will allow us to gaze into the depth of meaning that biblical history has to offer. Remember, the biblical authors aren't doing history like we're doing history. This is not a pipe. This is not a history. It's more. So this morning, we've had the opportunity to explore how to read the biblical books of history. Before I finish, I want to take a minute to at least acknowledge probably a more important question, um, and that is, why? Why do we read the biblical books of history? In John chapter 5, Jesus says to his Jewish listeners, context, you study the scriptures diligently, good, because you think that in them you have eternal life. But did you know, says Jesus, these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So I want to be careful here. I'll try to be clear. The Bible is a work of art. It's a real history. It's literary genius. The Bible is the inspired word of God, but it will not save you. The Bible does not give you life. I have a friend who's read the whole Bible, doesn't follow Jesus. Our eternities are going to look different. The Bible will tell you of complex characters. The Bible will draw you into brilliant settings. The Bible has a compelling plot, but listen, that plot only matters in as much as it reveals the one who all of this history is about. The Bible will not give you life, but it will reveal to you our life giver. This is not a pipe. This is not a history. This is a revelation. Jesus says that this story is about him. And so if you forget everything I said this morning about pipes and narratives and trees, just remember this. The Bible is a unified story that points only to Jesus. The Bible is a unified story that points only to Jesus. The whole story is about him because he is the king we need. You might not have been asking for him. He is the beloved son of God. He is the one who comes out of Egypt and redeems God's people. He is the faithful suffering servant who says, not my will, but yours be done, O Father. In obedience, he went to the cross. In glory, he rose again. And in mercy, he invites us into his history of redemption. So if I could leave you with this, read this book. Read this book. Learn its history. Fall in love with the Jesus it reveals. 
He will give you life. So in the narratives, you were talking about the example of Egypt as a setting. Yeah. Are we talking about a metaphor or literal Egypt? How does that kind of play out? Yeah, so, and Nicole, you've been helpful as we talked about this in the office. In yes, actually, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole's teaching next week. You can uh, clap for her then. Um, so, yes, it's, it's both. Uh, Egypt is a real history that happened, and also it transcends that historical reality and becomes a metaphor. A really good example of this is uh, there's events in our lives that have happened, but if we say it, a whole number of ideas come to our brains. Uh, Nicole, I was, I was born this year, so Nicole told me about this. The flood of 97, like if I say that? Some people, maybe more recent is if I say COVID, like you're not just thinking about COVID-19, the virus, you're thinking about all sorts of things. And so when, when Jewish uh, audiences heard Egypt, it's like, oh, you're returning to Egypt. That could be a physical thing, but also it's sort of, uh, it's, it's a metaphorical statement as well. Does that make, that make sense? Yeah, cool. that's great. So you're using the words character, plot, setting. These are often terms that are associated with fiction. So just for the, the sake of clarity, what are you saying about the narrative books of, of the Bible? Yeah. Uh, this is what happens when God tells stories. Reality happens. So in Genesis chapter 1, right away we're introduced to this God who speaks creation. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you a story, like if I said, like, make a wolf or something, like I used to pretend that I could make fire wolves. Um, you know, <laughs> make a fire, nothing happens. But when God <laughs> speaks, reality occurs. And so... Uh, and maybe this is answering another question, is like, who wrote the Bible? Because I talked a lot about authors. So we trust that the Bible is written by, by humans, but inspired by God. And so as, as much as human authors wrote these words down, they are unified by the Holy Spirit, telling one grand narrative that leads to Jesus. And so when God tells stories, reality happens. And so that means that God can use all of these narrative storytelling techniques uh, in ways that, uh, that you know, we, we likely wouldn't be able to uh, as humans. So it's not fiction, I think it's reality, and when God, when God tells stories, reality happens. I'm trying to think if I wanna say something else there. I think that's great. But like, okay, like was his name really Saul? Yeah, probably, but I think that's like, there's something about the divine inspiration there that his name was Saul. Mm -hmm. Ruth chapter one, right, there's two guys' names, their names mean uh, sick person and dying person, and f four, four verses later, they die, it's like, What's their purpose in the story? Like, why did their parents name them that? It's like, well, they were... <laughs> Anyways, like, isn't that funny, though? Like, it's, you're like, it's very interesting. Were their names really that? Were, was that the human author? I think it was God, and when God tells stories, reality happens. Mm -hmm. yep. I think that's a great way to sum up what you're talking about. Good. Will you close us? I will. Yes, thank you, Nicole. Um, I got coffee with a friend, an old coworker, this last Tuesday, and uh, he reminded me uh, that in ancient times and in ancient places, uh, those who wanted to give a blessing extended their hands, and those who wanted to receive a blessing opened their hands like this. I thought because we're talking about the biblical books of history, I would give you a historical blessing that's been given to the priests of Israel. It's another teach that we've all inherited that priesthood, but here it is. Would you receive this? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So go in peace. Thanks, Ryan.